All right, the time being 2.30, we're going to return back to our meeting. Um, Ms. Marks, do we need to call the roll to establish quorum, or was the recess brief enough where we were able, we can proceed? I don't think, I don't think it's uh, necessarily the need to call roll again to establish a quorum. It's just that when we're in this setting, it's always a good idea to make sure that your quorum still exists ah. because we don't know. So, um, so it is, um, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You're going to be calling names and seeing if everybody's here um, just because of uh, the technological limitations of being able to see who's there. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Marks. All right. Ms. McCook, Ms. McCook, ah, McCocker, <laughs> please go ahead and um, call the roll. Okay. Kasuga? Here. Cervantes? Here. Who? Here. Barb Sheep? Here. Nystrom? Here. Philip? Um, I see that he's on. Do I still mark him as here or do you want me to? Um, continue with the roll call, and we'll just go back to uh, Stephen. It could be he, he may have not unmuted himself. Okay. Uh, Rescate? I'm here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Rescate? Go back. Rogers? Here. Tate? Here. And... Riscate, are you able to unmute yourself? Hmm. Well, quorum is established, though, or still exists, I mean. But for Mr. McGuire. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't do that. Um, so Ms. Muscati is going to be joining us in about 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so. Um, but her, if she joins us midstream, if we take up item 15, um, she can participate midstream. Is that correct? And still participate in, the, in a final vote on 15 if a vote does occur? Were you directing that question at me, Mr. Fu? Uh, to either of you. <laughs> oh, okay. um, yeah, I don't see why not. This is not a matter of taking of evidence that will not be, uh, she would not be able to review. Perfect. All right. I just wanted to make sure, I want to make sure that we can um, include her participation at the end. Um, all right. So item 15 with regard to telehealth practices. So I believe also these were included as well in our two second day hand carry items that Mr. Glass Beagle um, alerted us to. And this is the language that is incorporating the feedback that Dr. Rogers provided us yesterday as well with her um, astute knowledge of the English language. Um, so what we're gonna so here's where we are. Um, Jason's gonna share it on screen as well. We have a copy of it. 
it's incorporating the language. So I just want to lay out a couple things here with 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 where we are, um, and just some reflections after some time to digest. Um, one, these the language here moving forward needs to be at least specific enough to provide guidance to staff for staff to make these determinations um, if we receive a complaint. So or we receive a call. So I think um, to the extent which there is some, um, you know, questions about subsections A1 through 6, I think a wholesale um, discard of them would, would not be beneficial to our board staff to be able to then delineate what is an acceptable, um, what is within the, the, the bounds or not. So I do think that as a board, we collectively need to come together and determine language moving forward that provides some contours um, for staff to be able to look into, to look at. Um, secondly, um, I think the intention here is to ensure that um, at the end of the day, a person in California receives con continuity of care um, if for some reason they have to engage in telehealth services and then are not located in California on a temporary basis. So I think that's an objective that we mutually share and how we get there is, is the tricky part. Um, and then the third is that um, this link, this, there's this outstanding question of the use of resident because resident implies um, a legal term that some folks may feel they are unable or not in the position to determine. When I think what we're trying to get at here from the comments yesterday from the board staff is, is really that we want is establishing a connection to the, to the state of California. That is that um, the, these, this language here um, is a reflection of, of this connection to the, to the state and the reason why we're promulgating these regulations. So with that, um, are there any other, uh, do board members have some comments on, on just initial take on where we are? Dr. Kasuga? I do. Um, I, um, yeah, I still think that we should consider finding a better word to use aside from resident that's um, one thing number two um, I find number six really confusing and um, not adding value so I'm wondering if um, Mr. Glassbeagle can talk a little bit more about why number six was added and um, that way we can decide whether to keep it or reword it so it's um, clearer. So those are my, my two main things. Great, Dr. Kusuga. Mr. Gossiegel, can you explain item six, please? Uh, number six, please. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll give my explanation and then if I've missed anything, uh, I'll uh, hand it over to Mr. Jackson. But there were comments received that talked about a patient or client um, being outside of the state of California and potentially uh, a resident of a state outside of that of California and then on vacation to a third state. And then um, how would that fit into any um, of the one through five? We found that it, it potentially didn't and so we came up with six. And I'll hand it over to Mr. Jackson if there's anything else. Uh, I'd like to add just that th on on all the comments that we got, there was a, almost everyone had very specific uh, scenarios, and and those scenarios were what we addressed in one to six. On this one in particular, there was questions by several commenters that specifically pulled out that someone was from another country, like on a visa here to work, or that someone was on, someone was, uh, let's say, from another state, 
where they they needed or wanted to keep the residency requirements of that other state so that so that the the question or the comment was very specific that that this person is not a California resident but they and that they do need to keep their residence of another jurisdiction which is why we wrote 6 because it was called out several times in different scenarios where they could not lose their residency of another state but they did want to receive services from a, a licensee within California. But they're not receiving services from a li the licensees within California is what you're saying. The licensees in California, hence the last, the last phrase, and is receiving services from a licensee within this state. Right, but I don't think this is one we want to include. Um, the reason being, this is, inter this is pure, <laughs> Interjurisdictional practice, where the resident has no, the, the person hasn't come to California yet. Service, they just live in another state, and the California, our California license in and of itself doesn't authorize somebody to practice interjurisdictionally in this way. So I actually think this is a category we do not want to add. And just, just to, to pull out the specific reference here, uh, there was a reference to, I believe, a woman who was, was uh, had domestic violence issues. There was a doctor in California who she would come to California and meet with, uh, thus getting the nexus to California, but then she'd go back to her other state, but still wanted to have treatment from that doctor in California because of the expertise of the doctor in California that she could not get outside of the state, or at least in her jurisdiction. So that's the one we wrote this one to, along with others with the visa issues or the, the students with the residence issues that couldn't lose their residence of another state. So that was that was it. But all, all of them did have a nexus to California. They just went back home. Yeah, but this doesn't, number six does not capture that. Number six does not say they've received services in California, returned to their jurisdiction, or returned to a jurisdiction. Um, I, you know, it's one thing, I think, for somebody who's received services in California and who's temporarily located outside of the state. We'll call that the college student scenario. Um, uh, but it's yet another thing, I think, to allow for us to say you're going to have a prolonged relationship after this, it's not a temporary situation necessarily from the sounds of things. So I'm not comfortable with number six. I, people can do it, and they'll just have to rely on the licensing jurisdiction in which that person resides. But I don't think we want to uh, weigh into that particular situation. I understand it's responsive to the comments, but the comments some of the people would like us just to give a general ability to practice uh, interjurisdictionally, and we, we're not going to do that. Um, Mr. Jackson, with, with regard to that situation described with a person who is um, a survivor of domestic violence, why wouldn't um, A1 qualify them to be able to continue receiving services? Because based on the description, they were driving into California previously. Um, so they were at, so they were a client at an originating site in the state, and now they're temporarily located outside, or they're located outside of the state. So, why wouldn't one fit that scenario? Uh, because because a one both both the client and the the doctor are located in California during the conversation, and this one was taken. The the additional green was added to better suit uh, 2290.5 to add language for the doctor side of that, that equation. But both under A1 are located in California at the time of the call or the contact. I think from a policy point of view, we don't want to do number six. I agree with that. Mr. Fuji, were you potentially referring to the situation fitting into A2 instead of A1? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Ms. Marks. So, thanks. Yes. 
Thank you, Ms. Marks. Um, yeah, so under the situation you described, this was a client who was receiving services in California and who is temporarily located outside of the state. I mean, that doesn't say anything with regard to residency. It doesn't say anything about giving up residency. It, it's giving it up to that person. Agreed. We had just tried to, as Dr. Phillips said, meet uh, what the commenters had requested because there was numerous of them who specifically mentioned the resident of another state. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any further board comments. So actually, I'm going to turn it over to public comment real quickly. Because I feel well, I have other, com other comment on this section, you mean? Or on this particular number six? Am I muted? No, you're not. No. Okay, sorry. Um, on uh, item six, just a quick question for clarification, and I think this might have come up in our uh, discussions on scenarios. Um, for the individual that, let's say, uh, came to a Betty Ford type of um, institute in California, but they were a resident of another state, would you cover that person once they go home and there was a continuity of care issue? Because that that was, I think, one of the reasons why we came up with six was to cover that instance where someone wasn't a resident of California and they wouldn't temporarily be out of state, but they there was a continuity of care issue once they went back home. So I just want to make that uh, question for clarification. Yeah, I think there's a distinction between somebody that goes temporarily out of state or has just left the state and there's some continuity of care you want to provide as they arrive in the place that they're at. That's distinctly different from, because what this is going to, so they could do five years of therapy with that person after they left Betty Ford where they've been for 30 days. And, and the difference between six and two are that two, the client is temporarily located outside the state. That would be the student that went home. The student right. then is home for six months or however long COVID lasts, and then they finally come back to California. But their intention is not to permanently be out of state because of their schooling. Right. And by the way, just in Betty Ford's defense, if somebody was going out of state, they would arrange for aftercare in that state. They wouldn't continue to work with that person. It's not appropriate um, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that I, I think we're including a scenario that goes beyond the scope of what our license allows for. So, Dr. Phillips, if I was to suggest then on item number two, on A2, um, to strike out the word temporarily, and just to say to a client who has received services in California and who is located and who is located outside of the state, you would not, that would not be helpful for you. Is that no. Okay. Um, which I think actually just in terms of putting some structure around, Dr. Harpsheets, go ahead. I, I was going to just add that we really are clinically obligated to help that person uh, find clinically and legally obligated to help that person find services in the state to which they've moved. So it, it, we couldn't leave the word temporarily uh, out of it. Absolutely. Understood. Okay. So um, I, I apologize. I should have done a better job facilitating this by putting a little bit more structure to this. So my suggestion is we go through items one through six on here, because I feel like that's the sticking point for, for all of us here. Um, and then um, and modify language as necessary and, and, and think through what is acceptable to us. Um, since we, Dr. Kasuga hopefully started us on item number six, we're going to take things a little bit out of order. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm also going to make sure that we go to public comments as we hit each one so we're not doing um, so that we have an opportunity for input. So. Um, what I'm hearing from Dr. Kasuga and Dr. Phillips, et cetera, is the language for number six is is um, is confusing and actually outside of the purview of our, the board's license. So it's, it's my understanding then the language here would just be stricken. Is that correct, Dr. Kasuga? That's my um, recommendation. 
All right, so the recommendation is for this language to be stricken on number six, or is there board uh, conversation or discussion on, on, on this? And it's not the final time, obviously, but any initial thoughts to this? I agree. Dr. Phillips, all right. Okay, so I don't see any additional, uh, Ms. Marks, you're unmuted. Do you have comments on that? Just a very quick clarification, um, very technical. We wouldn't be striking it because it was never added, it'd just be deleting it. So just to uh, distinguish between what is actually struck through, that's all. Ah, thank you, Ms. Marks. We will, Ms. Dr. Kasuga is proposing that we delete this language. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask the uh, moderator to, Madam Moderator, if you can please open up public comment. Um, and, and for folks, if you could just keep your public comment to this item that we're discussing, which is number six, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and the first person here we have is um, uh, Sarah Hutchell. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, Sarah Huckle with University of California, Office of the President. Um, we actually do like the language of number six and appreciate its inclusion um, for, this, for the main reason that many of our students who have not yet arrived on campus in this distance learning situation may have paid for student mental health services and have not been initially yet treated on campus but would like to access those resources from their home. We would not be able to take advantage of number two in this instance since they have not ever arrived on campus, but we do we would anticipate that they would return to California at some point to resume their studies, um, but they would like to avail themselves, themselves of the mental health services that they're currently paying for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Huckle. I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. Um, so actually, I have a if question. I might, from... If I might respond to that. This yeah, Mr. Jackson. Right. Uh, number two, well, the the person that she's discussing has a nexus to California because they are attending school in California. They're just not physically located in California, and so and so they've got it. They've got a nexus to California that that they're unfortunately not able to participate or partake of because they're out of state. So we might. We might want to either change one of the other ones to uh, uh, do that, but that is what number six was written to. So, just Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, so the, the, what you're saying is that the, in that scenario that Ms. Michael described, the student is receiving services in California because they paid fees and services to um, the University of California. Uh, to the University of California, that, that that would be the the presumption. Is that correct? More than paying the fees, it's the fact that they're actively attending school in California. They're just not actively attending school, warming a seat in California, and so <laughs> because because of COVID, and this was one of the big COVID issues that we kept reading about. You know, because of COVID, the school, all the students had to go home, but they still want to. They still want to you know, are paying for these services, which would be better for number two, but but when you bring up the students that can't, haven't yet come to California, but they are going to school in California. Thank you. Ms. Huckle, based on that interpretation, what are your thoughts now? Uh, as far as services, it would need to be uh, psychological services are what we're particularly looking for. Um, so I would I would appreciate there's perhaps more clarification as to what services the client has received because uh, at that point that individual would not have received psychological services in California if they have not yet um, moved here. I think the suggestion, Ms. Huckle, this is Dr. Phillips, I think the suggestion is that we rework too so that people who anticipate uh, or, or have some logical nexus to California I want to make use of those services rather than to create this catch-all category in the end where people can kind of willy-nilly practice relative to people that are out of state. Sure. Uh, and I believe that we suggested in our letter, and this may be um, a bit specific, but we, uh, we had even suggested perhaps um, putting some verbiage in there about uh, particularly university or college students who are away for this 
uh, for these reasons, since it's a very specific but highly mobile population. Right. You, I, I'm sure the university still understands that if they're providing services to somebody that's located in another state, there's still the licensing laws of the other state. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. But we have such okay. a, um, a broad student base that uh, it, it's a bit much for our student health centers to be on top of where each student comes from and in the, in the individual um, licensing laws in each circumstance. Yeah, that is, that's the responsibility of the licensee. Yes, yes. To see if they're running afoul of the laws in the other state. Yes. Or we, very, you know, we very much appreciate the inclusion of the um, inclusion of the green text at the beginning, which is not currently on the screen, but not limited, but including language as well. Right. Um, and, you know, there are lots of choices our licensees could make about telepsychology. It wouldn't be necessarily within this list. Some of them might be permissible. Some of them might not be. Mm -hmm. Responsibility in them is going to be able to determine, particularly as it relates to other jurisdictions, whether it's permissible what they're doing. Um, all we're trying to do is give some guidance as to what the scope of their license in California allows them to do. Right. Uh, we, we can rework two in some way that will provide for that situation, which is the yet-to-arrive student. <laughs> we would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. But I think number six is a non-starter because it, it speaks much more broadly than that. It kind of is a general invitation to do interjurisdictional practice. I don't think we want that. Thank you, Ms. Huckle. Um, Dr. Winkleman? Um, thank you. I also appreciate the addition of the language of included and but not limited to. Um, that's very helpful. Um, there were two additional related points to this discussion I wanted to make. One is, is that the license, California license, is in fact a basis for practicing outside of state in that I think about 48 states specifically have temporary practice laws that are based on your California license. So, in fact, the California license is completely relevant to being able to practice temporarily out of state, as I think you all know. But it certainly isn't a free-for-all because in the five-year example, of course, that would never happen. Maybe at most a person could do a short-term treatment with someone out of state. Um, and one example that's not covered here, and perhaps you just don't want to include it, but what it, uh, one of our members brought up, they, they have a narrow uh, expertise, and it was in our letter of treating people who have racial trauma and have experienced a loss. And if somebody has a very specific um, expertise, sometimes people from out of state do want to obtain those services, even though they don't, the patient doesn't have a nexus, but they would be allowed to do so for a relatively short-term treatment on the base of the temporary practice laws. And finally, I wanted to mention, which no one has mentioned so far, and I think this is relevant as well, is that under California law right now, um, somebody who has an out-of-state license in another state that's not California can practice temporarily 30 days per year. In other words, five months of treatment, which is much longer than the average length of treatment. So, um, so I feel like kind of that the overall thrust is that you're, if you really want to protect California clients, but then it, it uh, but you're allowing somebody with a license out of state for 30 days to practice here, it seems like, it just seems like it's placing some restrictions, although there is a language of included but not limited to, which I appreciate. It just, to me, still sounds like it's placing you know, unnecessarily implying unnecessary restrictions on telehealth that puts uh, the California psychologist um, in somewhat of a disadvantage compared to other people and compared to current practice regarding the flexibility to do telehealth. Thank you, Dr. Winkleman. Um, Dr. Jolene McCoy requested to make comment, but she withdrew it. So we'll go to Dr. Or to excuse me to Edward Howard. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Ed Howard, on behalf of the uh, Children's Advocacy Institute at the University of San Diego School of Law. Uh, thank you very much for a, a really thoughtful conversation. I, I want to speak uh, briefly on question six um, because it, I was uh, hurriedly and uh, 
uh, not particularly competently, attempting to look at your scope of practice laws related to the discussion about, sec about number six, because the premise for deleting it appears to be an interpretation of current scope that would forbid an out-of-state resident or citizen from being able to get services remotely uh, uh, from a California licensee under California law. I'm simply not sure if that's accurate. Um, it certainly may not be accurate under the laws of other jurisdictions. And I think the addition to the regulation above in the, in the overarching uh, subdivision A uh, aptly takes care of that, uh, subject to the laws of the other jurisdiction. So assuming for the sake of discussion, because of A, it requires us to assume that, that it is perfectly fine under the laws of the state of Nevada for a Nevadan to be able to obtain uh, services from a California psychologist. Under that circumstance, it simply, and this is not the skeptical, I don't, I'm, I'm unclear, it's the genuinely I don't know. Under that circumstance, I don't know that it would be on, would be in fact be beyond the scope of a California licensee uh, to do what six contemplates. And so I, I would, because of the importance of it potentially, because it, in, in our view, it's quite important uh, not to, to, to not impose any constraint on the ability of a California licensee, especially during this time, um, to be able to offer uh, services to as many people through telehealth as the law currently allows. I, I think before you, you take it out on the basis of the premise, it'd be useful to, to have kind of a definitive reading about whether or not that hypothetical that I just outlined whether or not it's lawful from a citizen or a resident of another state to seek services here, whether or not that is in fact beyond the scope of a California licensee. Uh, with that, and, and I thank you very much for um, uh, deleting the last uh, provision, uh, which was the subject of our comments uh, most. Um, with that, I, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Um, Dr. McCall? Just a brief reiteration of uh, Dr. Phillips statement that, you know, California can decide to do whatever it wants to do. But if that patient's located in another jurisdiction, then the licensee is really subject to what the limitations of that other jurisdiction are. That uh, should certainly be, you know, I would say emphasized to our licensees as we're going through these discussions that, you know, if, if the patient's out of state, out of state, then uh, that's where a lot of the, uh, the jurisprudence is going to is going to come down to. I, mean, I just wanted to reiterate that from Dr. Phillips' statement. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Dr. McCall. Dr. Jolinda Crow. Hi. Yes. Um, Jolinda Crow, the California Psychological Association. Um, I also want to support the mission of delaying language in number six. I also um, have a, a I, I'm a little disconcerted because I. I feel like um, this is what we feared yesterday when we began talking about scenarios. Um, it's beginning to sound a little bit like the discussion is centered on the scenarios as being the only things that a psychologist can do via telehealth, rather than focusing on the, the language that several people have mentioned of including but not limited to. Actually, the operative language is the language in the beginning. The operative language is not the scenarios. The most important thing is, is um, this beginning language that says uh, you can do this, but you have to do it subject to the laws and regulations of, of other, other jurisdiction where either the licensee and or the client is located. That's how this starts out. And I, I'm just afraid that, you know, if you want to include the scenarios, and I believe the board has decided to do that, but let's not forget that the language of including but not limited to was added by one of your board members. I think it's it's critical language, and, you know, the, the focus should be on the beginning and not on, on all of these scenarios as much as it sounds right now. Dr. Linda Crow, Dr. Phillips. Yeah, I, I kind of want to go back to what the purpose of this is. The purpose in us putting the scenarios in there was the purpose was to let people know of specific situations 
where it might be a permissible extension of their um, of their license, and their license is to protect is to to um, provide services to consumers that are either residents of the state of California, located in California, or have been located in California, or temporarily outside of California. All those are within the purview of what would be permissible um, interpretations of our licensing laws. I'm not saying these other things are prohibited by our licensing laws. I'm just saying I think it's a mistake to give guidance to individuals that they can do something that the California license does not authorize them to do. They may have authority to do it, but the California license doesn't authorize them to do it. And if they do it, they're making a decision on their own to do it. We don't want to give them the impression that their license permits them to do this because it doesn't. And I think that's, I, I'm not interested in prohibiting people from doing things with this. I am interested in providing some scenarios that would help to guide people as to what their California license allows them to do. They can do anything else they want to do, but they've got to take the chances that it's not permissible. It might be permissible under the temporary practice provision. Um, Dr. Winkleman, we're well aware of the temporary practice provisions. We refer people to them with quite quite a, about a lot of frequency. However, uh, that's up to the other jurisdiction as to whether they're going to permit the conduct to occur or not, um, because it's not within the purview of the California license. So I want to go back to the idea we're trying to get guidance as to what would be allowable under their California license with reference to um, the laws outside the state of California. I don't want to list every possible situation in which people could do telehealth. I think it's going to confuse the hell out of people. Dr. Phillips? I mean, yeah, although I appreciate, you know, that people want to to um, cover a lot of different contingencies. I don't think that's our objective here. We're trying to give some guidance as to what the California license allows them to do. doesn't mean that other things aren't permissible for them to do. It just means that it's not really within the scope of what we do. We regulate for the benefit of consumers of, of psychological services in the state of California whether those persons are residents, whether they're temporarily domiciled here, whether they come here for service. We, so we can't, we're not an agency that, that um, permits people to do interjurisdictional practice um, and the authority to permit them to do interjurisdictional practice. They might be able to do interjurisdictional practice, but that's not our, that's not our concern. That's not the scope of, in the scope of what we do. So with those comments, Dr. Phillips, and, and again, going back to this, this, thinking through about the mechanics of this, I mean, it's, this is going to be a policy decision by the board whether or not the, what language is included. So I think the question to this board is, with regard to at least um, line item number six, you know, is, are, are we deleting that language in this proposed text here? Um, and that's the policy of the board, right, that we're proposing and, and, and that we're essentially at least in this discussion point, saying that we are comfortable with that policy decision. Is it fair to say, Dr. Phillips? That's what I'm suggesting. All right. So just for purposes of tracking the conversation, the, are there, a, for those, do you have a, do, are there board members with a differing perspective on number six that they would like to raise? So seeing none, what I'm, I'm going to suggest that Mr. Glass Beagle, you do, is mark this up just to show it deleted. But but this is a work in progress, right? So I don't want folks who are watching to get this impression that the, this is actually what the board is doing. But this just reflects, at least at this point in time, where the board's discussion is going, 
with in relation to the public comment that we also received as well. So um, seeing that, I'm going to go back to, to item number one, I, just to get clarity, to a client at an originating site in the state as defined in section 2290.5, et cetera, um, are there proposed changes to this language here? From board members. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, uh, yes, Dr. Harpsheet. Um, wait, could you, could somebody just read what section 2290.5 actually says? Or does somebody, can maybe somebody just tell me what it says? So this is in reference to the um, Business and Professions Code which states that for purposes of this division, the following definition shall apply. Asynchronous, oh, is this right? Yes, asynchronous store and forward means the transmission of a patient's medical information from an originating site to the healthcare provider at a distant site without the presence of the patient. Is that correct, um, counsel, um, with regard to that reference? Mr. Fu, if it's helpful, I can pull up 2290.5. It's a very long section. So that, that was enough for me. I, I mean, so basically, number one is just saying, yes, you can do telepsychology within the state. Right? That, that's what it looks like to me is saying. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and President Fu accurately read the 2290.5A1. Does that, um, so that, that satisfies your question, Dr. Harpsheet? Yes, exactly, yes. Great, okay. So um, I'm not seeing any questions here um, with re or, or request for modification for this text. Um, I'm gonna go move to item number two. Um, to a client who has received services in California and who is temporarily located outside of the state, I believe, based reflecting on the conversations and input from Ms. Huckle, in particular from the University of California, there's a way to work this language so that it's inclusive of students who are not physically located here um, because they started as either a transfer student or as a um, new student remotely, um, and that they may be located outside of the state. So. As currently presently written, the receive services in California um, is, um, is, is one of the things out there. And I believe the language that University of California offered was um, something along the lines of including a student who is enrolled in an institution of higher education in California, but is not yet present in California. So I wonder if that language should also just be listed out or written now, or if that, that's too specific? I, I think that the concern that was expressed is that they may have not, because they have not been able to come to campus and obtain psychological services, that this number two suggests that they had already begun services here. And so I think the concern, if I heard it correctly, was to just indicate that it was they didn't have to have already taken uh, started psychological services, um, and I, I does that make sense? Is that the, yeah, so, I, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I think we're both trying to say this, the same thing in, in agreement with Doc, with uh, Ms. Huckle that we're we're trying to capture this group of people who haven't started receiving services in person in California, but maybe tapping into these services over telehealth because they have enrolled as a student in the University of California system. I have a recommendation if it would be helpful. Yes, please, Dr. Rogers. Um, so I have to a, to a client who is the recipient of services in California, whether through in-person services or virtual format. I, I, I'm wondering if that captures people who are currently receiving services because they're physically present, 
um, and also captures those folks who are not physically present in California, but um, as Ms. Huckle said, are enrolled at a university here in California, but they are not physically present, but they're still receiving services virtually. I think we have to make it much more specific than that, because then we're okay. saying, if somebody initiates telehealth with a psychologist in the state of California, that they're within the permissible scope of their license, which is not true. It, it's not that they're at, it's not that they're not permitted to do it, but the license doesn't authorize them to do it. I see. So I think we'd need to say something specifically about students that are enrolled in an institution of higher ed education. Mm -hmm. I use the higher education language. Um, who have yet uh, who have who have yet to to uh, receive services in the state of California? It's a very specific mm -hmm. it's a it's a very specific situation that we're talking to. Sure. Because I think if we broaden it out, I think if we broaden it out too far, we end up with number six again. Mm -hmm. Bork, um, hi, this is Clay. Could we just uh, revise six to to say what you're saying? so that we can leave two alone and then revise six for just that specific scenario? Sure. Since two and six are in relation to each other, can we mock up? I know we're jumping a little bit around, so um, can we mock up what that six would look like then? And, and I'm aware that, that I know that there are folks eagerly waiting to do public comment for the discussion thus far, and we'll get to that, I promise, um, to have yes. input in live time. But, um, Can yeah. Dr. Rogers just read her uh, comment again? Sure, Jason, no problem. Uh, to a client who is the recipient of services in California, uh, whether through in-person services or virtual format, but also including the language that Dr. Phillips recommended in terms of being enrolled in uh, an institution of higher education. Does somebody have specific language, Dr. Phillips? <laughs> This is Sayron, um, but the language that the University of California has is um, including a student who is enrolled in an institution of higher education in California, but is not yet present in California. But who is not yet present, is that what you said? That is correct. And we would um, delete the, a resident of another jurisdiction outside the state, et cetera, would be that. Up to here. Well, I think um, if the- All the way to the end of the sentence. Yeah, all the way to the end. Okay. I just need, um, some confirmation from Ms. Huckle at some point that the university realizes they're still subject to the temporary practice laws of the other jurisdictions because we cannot provide them any solace in that regard. Understood. I think what we'll do is we'll go to public comment um, because we've done some substantive changes here that I, I think it's important for us to get feedback on. But I know Noreen, uh, Ms. Marks, and Mr. Jackson both are unmuted. So I turn it over to our council. Uh, I, I guess I'll go. Um, I have, to, I'm very mindful of the situation that COVID has created and the problems that it has created for many students who expected to come here and have not. I am, however, concerned with this language for a couple reasons. Um, one, it says, who is not yet present in California. That person may never be present in California. So I'm not quite sure how to address what may end up being a permanent 
um, remote learning situation. Uh, two, we, this would, I don't see why this wouldn't apply to an institution that is solely an online institution, of which there are many located in California. So you're, you're talking about an institution that may not even have a brick and mortar location in California. Um, and, and three, it says what it says um, to a client who's the recipient of services in California, I'm wondering if that's inconsistent with the definition of originating site in 2290.5. We have looked at the place where services are rendered as where the client is located, so I'm not quite sure that's consistent with that. Um, and then I think lastly, the my issue would be whether or not this creates a situation for students who I understand um, may be as part of their tuition paying for certain ser services and who are particularly mobile, but whether or not we actually have a, a, um, a sufficient reason to say students get to have these um, services and we will bless that arrangement, whereas we're, we won't for some other category. So those would be my comments. Mr. Jackson? I, I muted it again. I, um, I agree with Noreen. Okay, so I think it actually might make sense for us to go to public comment at this point, um, following on Ms. Mark's comments. Um, so, because I think she asked some interesting questions that I, I suspect that um, we have folks who might be able to answer on the public comment side. So, um, Madam Moderator, could you please open the public comment section for this so that we can have a conversation about what we've covered thus far? I do have it open right now. And Elizabeth, I see that you would like to make a comment. I will go ahead and unmute you. So sorry about that. Hi. Hi, thank you. It's uh, Elizabeth Winkleman again. Um, I agree with Noreen's concern about uh, that the language would need to be modified in number six because recipient of services in California makes it sound like the patient would be in California. So I agree that that would need to be fixed and also not yet present. You could say who is not present in California, but I think not yet would be problematic. Um, I, uh, and I also just wanted to point out that even in the scenarios that are described here um, in two and three, to somebody who has initiated uh, services in California and then moved outside, uh, as in the first paragraph, even that is um, subject to the laws of the other state, which is included in the first paragraph, but it's just confusing. In other words, the California board, of course, can't say just because we may think it's a good idea that somebody who started services in this state should be able to continue in the other states. Um, that that isn't something that California can do for sure, but that is included in a careful reading of the first two sentences. Um, but I think all these questions, again, just raise the issue of the complications of trying to give examples, whether rather than just letting people practice to the full extent of the interjurisdictional practice laws. Thank you, Dr. Winkleman. Um, Ms. Huckle? Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, that uh, the comments that yes, um, the University of California and our practitioners understand that we are subject to the laws of other states. Um, the concern was that um, our counselors were worried about providing emergency psychological services in another jurisdiction um, uh, without having checked and possibly being in violation of those other jurisdictions laws and that being automatically considered under professional conduct in California. Um, so we appreciate the striking of that language um, in the uh, proposed regulations further down. Ms. Huckle, just a quick comment. Ms. Marks also brought up this conversation that 
what if we live in a world where this not present in California, actually, this just won't end up in California for a lot of different reasons, well, because of remote learning. Uh, could we speak to some language of intent to go? I mean, we really don't know how long the coronavirus will work, but you see at least at this point is, is planning on enrolling everyone in person. I just said, okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. McCall? I'd like to begin by recognizing the difficulty and the challenges that the board has in coming up with uh, appropriate language to address the issue. Uh, I think I'm reminded of our conversation earlier where uh, I believe one of the board members identified that, you know, frequently asked questions and the whole FAQ when we were talking about the CPD, um, you know, can almost kind of lead to more complication. Um, and, and I find myself, um, you know, as I, as I participate in this and I think about myself as someone who I get calls to do ethics consults and professional consultation and stuff like that when um, people do take some of those nuggets and then really try to dig into them um, rather than seeing the bigger picture. Uh, I, I think I, I'll just say is, is someone who kind of does the consultation work and um, uh, at the same time recognizing y'all's difficulty, I think I lean towards uh, Dr. Uh, Linda Crow and Dr. Winkleman's ideas that I think that maybe just leaving it at the, at the first part without the examples, you know, notwithstanding I, I, I get the benefit of examples, but we also talked earlier how they can be challenging. Um, you know, I, I feel like that you know, for the for the lawyers in the bunch here, it's almost like that very important operative language of, you know, subject to the other language, other jurisdictions laws, almost get kind of like buried like bad facts, like in the middle of, um, uh, of the middle of the statute. So just my observation as someone who's uh, listening in. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. McCall. Uh, thank you, Dr. McCall. And, and not seeing further and any further public comment and bringing this back to the board for discussion. Um, Dr. Kasuga? I do echo um, the sentiment about like A, really capturing a lot of what is really intended and what is allowed for our licensees. So um, I, when I was um, thinking about this section um, last night, I, really think that it shouldn't be exhaustive. It should, if we're gonna add um, one or two examples, it should be to clarify and not to further confuse. So if there is any, because we don't have to add any of these. And if we're gonna add them, it has to have a purpose of um, clarifying, but not um, capturing all the, the scenarios out there in this world. So that's kind of like where I'm coming from. So it's better to have, um, for the sake of clarifying, a few um, items, but if it's problematic, then we don't have to add it, given that there is a line that says that including but not limited to. Thank you, Dr. Kasuga. Board members, any other board members have comments about this? It's a conundrum. I mean, I can I speak? Yeah. Sorry, Stephen. I think that Dr. Kasuga makes it a good point that adding different examples, um, if we do so, it should be for the goal of clarifying versus confusing. And it seems to me that, right, you know, we're going over and over and that really what we say in A, um, you know, that they're permitted to do this, uh, ver you know, subject to the laws and regulations of the other jurisdiction, you know, really to me, it personally feels like enough because there are so many potential complications that um, I, I, I just feel it's getting confusing. Well, then what I would suggest is 
that we take the cleanest, including but not limited to examples, and include and jettison the rest. I do think that um, Ms. Marks and subsequent commenters have brought up an interesting subject as it relates to the University of California situation. Not only that there are institutions of higher education in California that don't have a real physical presence, people don't go to a campus there, they, they're entirely online courses, but also what are we, isn't what we're saying in six now similar to what we were saying in six before, which is uh, you can practice with consumers that are out of state because they've got some, but, but they've never been consumers in California. In theory, they're still not consumers in California, I guess, except as it relates to the mental health services. I think number six would have to be much more circumspect. I think we can eliminate some of these examples, um, but the examples that we have created, you should be aware, are the situations that licensees ask about the most. So we are, again, not going to be providing guidance to licensees as to what, um, what is permissible under the California license subject to uh, licenses, licensing laws in other jurisdictions. So all we're really doing is putting out guidelines on best practices, on um, best practices as it relates to the actual performing of the service, not any guidance as to who you can perform the service with. So, with so that I don't, I don't think that really satisfies what licensees have been asking of us. It'd be easier. I think it's easier. I'll agree it's easier. Can we, though, is it, do we need to give this kind of guidance in the regulations? Could that be in FAQs separately? Here's some, in, in these examples, here's how we would look at it versus actually in the regulations. I, would that be an example? I'm just concerned about the underground regulations conversation that Mr. Jackson brought up that the FAQs end up being some sort of underground regs instead of doing it to the proposed language. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you for that reminder. Ms. Marks? Uh, just a comment. It, it, it's always going to be very specific as to how the FAQs respond to any particular question when, when there's a problem, but we do always have to be mindful of that. It does not mean that all FAQs would end up being underground regs. So, um, thank you, Ms. Marks. Okay, so I would love just thoughts to get a little bit more sense as to see if there's energy or synergy from more board members about keeping um, language as just an edge. Dr. Phillips, did you have a comment? I noticed you're unmuted. I just want to make sure. No, it was a mistake. No worries. Um, so I think I just want to highlight that, um, just get a sense of where folks are um, and do a quick temperature and pulse check. So um, what I'm hearing is at least, from at least Dr. Kusuga has reproposed essentially keeping just the language in A um, as written. Um, and then I'm also then hearing from Dr. Phillips, um, okay, we don't have to produce an exhaustive list, but let's just pick up one or two examples from this list that we have here that are the cleanest that we can then attach to the including but not limited to conversation. So I just want to do a check-in with our board members here where folks would like to go given this false dichotomy I've given you to narrow the options, if you will from board members who may have not spoken or shared their thoughts yet on this. I would just, could I just add a third, which is that we leave out examples altogether. That's kind of where my, I'm feeling it. I think that's actually Cheryl's example. It's Cheryl's proposal is that we just do language A with no examples. So okay. a licensee is permitted to provide psychological health care service by a telehealth subject to the laws and regs of the other jurisdiction where either the licensee and or the client is located full stop and then delete everything beneath that. I think that's Cheryl's proposal. Okay, sorry. 
That was my proposal. Actually, my proposal, that was my proposal yesterday. And um, I still really like that. But if we are to um, add um, examples, uh, I propose it's ones that are helpful for clarifying and not confusing, further confusing. So that's kind of like where I, I stand right now. Great. So, so those are the, the, the false choices before, <laughs> just for the purposes of clarification. And I saw Dr. Tate had gone unmuted. I did. I, I was favor. you know, all these options are interesting. Um, I was favoring including the but not limited to and including two different examples. Um, but, you know, these are slippery slopes a little bit, you know. One example, four, four examples, um, in, in my head, saying including but not limited to should cover it all. That's just my personal preference. Dr. Rogers? Uh, my preference is, uh, I'm thinking about the conversation from yesterday and uh, the discussion about licensees calling into the board and staff having to field all of the calls with different types of scenarios. So I'm not in favor of uh, deleting all of these examples, but I am in favor of keeping those, as Dr. Phillips recommended, those that are uh, the most clear and provide more clarity instead of continuing to add different uh, categories that might lend itself to more confusion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Rogers. Ms. Cervantes? Um, I, I echo uh, Dr. Rogers. I, I want to provide uh, enough support so that the staff can, uh, with clarity, answer questions. Um, the, the circumstances of COVID um, creates um, different types of workflow needs on our staff. And I think this is an opportunity for us to provide um, some clarity and some support in that so that um, we have some some uh, clarity in terms of policy intent that can then be uh, better communicated with uh, licensees. Um, and I think we, we should um, strive to do that in a concise way that only that takes into account uh, some high, le like at a really high level, most likely scenarios. Um, I, you know, I'm very partial to folks in higher ed, but I just wonder if um, we might be able to phrase those those types of examples for um, more generally, so that it encompasses uh, more possibilities, and um, just keep it succinct and clear. Thank you, Ms. Cervantes. Um, I, I want to turn to either um, Ms. Nystrom or Ms. Rosate. Just to ask if they have um, any, um, if, if they have, if they would like to say any remarks around this in particular. Hi, this is Julie. Um, I have been listening as a new member, um, and I, um, you know, I've. I've find that there's a balance between giving enough examples, um, as others have said, without you know, making it more confusing. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to read that, um, the thread through that needle. Um, and so I appreciate this whole, uh, discussion um, that the board is having on this. And, um, and, and I think we're in the right direction. I wish I had. I wish I had more experience to be able to offer more. Um, but I'm I'm comfortable with um, you know examples as long as they're clarifying and not more confusing. Thank you. Hi, this is Anna, and I echo what Julie said um, in regards to being new and kind of just listening and. 
Um, I'm also not against um, having examples. And I think F and Qs in general across all industries are usually meant to have examples for just the most common questions. And then there's usually an additional um, protocol for something that maybe is not covered. Um, so that's uh, that's what that's why I feel. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Roscate, and the senior strategist of communications has come through. Um, thank you for that. Um, doc, Dr. Phillips, your hand is up, and I know that Ms. Dr. Kasuga has her phone, has her um, mic on mute as well. So let's. So, yeah, my suggestion would be the following. I think most people can agree. That if somebody's in an originating state, state in California, and the and the practitioners in California, that's a permissible use of telehealth. So number one seems to pass the muster. I mean, you had to put over the language a little bit, but I think that passes muster. Um, number two was something specifically that people asked for, for the college student that had gone home for the summer, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's an allowable situation. Um, and certainly one that comes up relatively often. I think number three is problematic in its term use of the term resident. So maybe we need to specify without relationship to citizen or immigration status. Um, but whoever's in California where, um, and is temporarily located out of the state, great, go for it. To a client who's in the state when the licensee is gone, that's a typical situation. It's been a typical situation for the last. I don't know, ever since I started practicing, people go on vacation, they end up having to call their patients, patients have an emergency, whatever. Um, and then to a client who's, a, and again, the resident of California thinks problematic, who's temporarily located outside of the state, when the licensee's also temp temporarily located out of the side of the state, it's a very particular situation. I don't know that we need to include it. Um, number six, maybe in that's reconstituted form, maybe problematic in the sense that I think I think to allow that situation is to allow us to is, is to tell um, licensees it's okay to work with people out of, outside of the state, which it is in general, but it's not really authorized by your license to do it. Um, you'd have to look at the licensing laws where that person's located unless they're they're a California consumer of psychological services. So um, I say we keep one, two, three, and four, rework the residence thing, and jettison everything else. I I just, this is Maricela, and I just want to agree with uh, Dr. Phillips on this. Dr. Katsugo, your, your mic's unmuted. And thanks, Mr. Bacchus. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Fu. Um, I agree with, that was actually my plan as well. Um, Dr. Phillips read my mind. I am in favor of one, two, and four. Um, number three, I think is problematic because of the use of residence. So uh, whatever is, um, so to a client who is based in California who is temporarily located outside of the state. Um, so um, I am, because I'm against the resident word, we can either just remove it because it's captured by including but not limited to or change, you know, residence or something else. But I'm completely fine with just keeping one, two, and four. Thank you. And actually, I think for, if a client was a resident of the state of California and they were temporarily located outside of the state, I think they'd be covered under number two anyway. Exactly, so that's what I think. As well. So I think we could get, I think we could do one, two, and four as included but not limited to. There's lots of other situations that come up that could be permissible. The California consumer who went out of state and their practitioner went out of state and they talked while they were both out of state. That's fine, but we don't have to necessarily anticipate that situation. We, we keep the examples that people are comfortable with and get rid of the rest of them. And I, I say that with all due um, respect to, to Ms. Huckle. I uh, have the greatest of respect for her and I'm an alumnus of the University of California, uh, but um, I, uh, 
I, I, that is going to be a very difficult area to weigh into and isn't necessarily necessary to our examples. Um, it's not we're saying that, uh, that practitioners at the University of California can't do that. I just don't think our licensing laws give them authority to do it purely based on their California license. And I, I have the feeling the university's looking for assurance that we're cool with it. And I think the answer has to be we're cool with it as long as the other jurisdiction's cool with it, because that's really whose licensing laws are operating under. I think that's a good – well, first of all, I'm hearing a little bit of a consensus around one, two, and four. So I'm going to throw it out there to ask if, if there's a motion, perhaps, to uh, adopt the modified text. I'd gladly make that motion. <laughs> um, and I'm, it looks like I have Dr. Rogers unmuted and Dr. Tate unmuted. So I'm sorry. Before I'm just going to second. All right. So, so just to make sure we have our motions clear and what language we're looking at, um, I just want to clarify that I think Dr. Kasuga has made the motion and seconded by Dr. Rogers that we are that we're adopting the modified text of the language in A, 1, 2, and 4. Um, and this will be for 15-day notice, correct, Ms. Marks? I think that's um, also Mr. Jackson's uh, purview, but yes, you'd be approving the notice, uh, the modified text as you're setting out here for 15-day notice. Agreed with the with the other text that's that's been changed here from the original text. Ah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Ms. Marks and, Ms., and Mr. Jackson, and apologies. Having so many councils, it's, it's abundance mentality, and I love it. Okay. <laughs> um, it's all right. So let's get this motion right. So it's the motion to adopt the modified text that um, is presented before us um, for 15-day notice. Um, it's been moved by Dr. Kasuga and seconded by uh, Dr. Rogers. Um, I'm going to turn to public comment um, on the motion before us, and I, and I think I had um, – so, so we have Dr. Joe Necro, and I, I believe Mr. Howard um, had his hand raised and may not have been able to – input that they would like to make comments. So I just want to make sure that if Mr. Howard still with us, he um, it type that he would like to make comments. But Dr. Jo Linda Creo for public comment, please. Yes. Hi. Jo Linda Creo with the California Psychological Association. Um, I like your changes, and I want to comment on just one thing. I think I, I may have mentioned it yesterday. I actually do believe that you are providing guidance to your licensees. And I was struck by the last thing that my colleague, uh, Dr. Phillips, said. The number, the first part of the question that your licensees have is, can I practice telehealth with a person in another state? Am I forbidden by the Board of Psychology to do that? So the answer is no, you're not forbidden by the California Board of Psychology. The second part of the answer is you need to look at these regulations because it says you can do that. As Dr. Phillips said, we're cool with that as long as the other jurisdiction is cool with that too. So this does fill that gap of answering that first part of that question, and, and it's going to be very helpful, I think. So thank you for uh, persisting. and. Um, and, and grappling with this because I know it's been hard and it's it's, it's very complicated, uh, but I think you've 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 narrowed it down here, and I think it will be a helpful uh, regulation. Thank you, Dr. Jolin Nicole. And for the record, that was not our timer on our end, <laughs> so just want to make sure that the noise that folks heard was not a timer that we've instituted for this. Um, is somebody is somebody riding a bicycle? Um. Mr. Howard, I understand your hand was raised. I just want to make sure that you don't have public comment for the motion before us. Okie dokie. 
I don't see him in the attendee list now, so okay. thank you for addressing addressing that. Could have been uh, Thank you so much, VOP moderator, for that. Um, so I, it may have been a leftover hand raise because I, I do know that Mr. Um, Howard did speak on another public comment section item. Um, so, all right. Okay, so I don't see any additional public comment on this, so I'm going to ask that Madam Moderator close the section, this, uh, this public comment section. I'm now going to bring it back to the board um, just to see um, in case they have um, – sorry, I'm getting D – um, uh, Mr. Fu, I see a couple of hands raised. Y yeah, and that's what I'm – Used by because I think we've made very clear that the can raising function is not the way to do public comment, that it is to type you want to make comment. So I'm going to, out of courtesy to folks, just want to make sure we, um, sorry, Madam Moderator, could you reopen public comment so that we can capture folks? And if you are making public comment, to please type in to the Q&A box, I would like to make comment. We usually have that slide back up, but for our um, purposes, we're trying to keep the modified language up. So I believe I saw a hand raised by Ms. Huckle, is that correct? And Ms. Huckle, do you, do you want to make a public comment? Oh, yes, I just wanted to thank the board for their deliberation on this item. Um, and I believe as long as the including but not limited to um, is remains as long as um, sub C being struck, I, th I think we could definitely work with that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Huckle. Really appreciate it and um, you sticking with us here too. Um, all right, so I don't see other, can we confirm there are no hands up? I, I don't see any on my screen, but I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. All right. I just see Ms. Huckle, but she just commented, so I think we're good. Okay, great. Um, Beyonce, one thing, put your hands up. All right, so um, we're going to close out public comment. Thank you all for your comments and, and to Dr. Jolinder Crow's point about persistence. Um, so bringing it back to the board, any further discussion, differing opinions, strong objections? All right, not seeing any mics going unmuted or any hand raises amongst board members. I'm going to ask that Ms. McCochran call the roll. Okay. Katsuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Carb sheets? Aye. Nystrom? Aye. Phillips? Aye, and I love you all. <laughs> Riscate? Aye. Rogers? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much. And I believe I would be remiss if I didn't follow up with a second motion for the board to delegate to the executive officer authority to adopt to um, make any non-substantive changes. Can I get Ms. Marks? I see yeah, you and, to adopt, and to adopt the modified text in the absence of negative comments. Great. So the, um, I'm, I'm requesting a motion that the board delegates to the executive officer authority to adopt the modified text in the absence of any negative comments. Um, make any. Uh, continue with the process to finalize the regulatory package, including making any non-substantive changes. Ms. Cervantes is unmuted, so I'm assuming you're moving, and Dr. Tate's unmuted, so I'm assuming she's seconding. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Great. So Cervantes moved, seconded by Dr. Tate. Additional comments from the board? Uh, I, this is Clay. I have one one question. Sure. Did the Did the new motion also include putting this out for 15-day comment? Yes, that was the original motion by, I believe, Dr. Rogers. That was the motion we just voted on. I just, just, want to make sure, just want to make sure there's been so much discussion on this. I've been back and forth. Okay, good. Thank you. No worries. And um, can, actually, I want to, since you brought it up, I just want to confirm, can our, can our wonderful staff who've been taking notes confirm that we did say that in the last motion? Hi, this is Lizelle. Yes, that was in the last motion. Thank you so much, Ms. McCochran. All right, so that's covered. Great. So moved by Cervantes, seconded by um, Dr. Tate. No further board discussion. Let's open up public comment.
All right, opening up public comment. If you'd like to make a public comment, please type in that you would like to make a comment. Seeing none, what we're going to do is close public comment, bring it back to the board. Seeing no board members unmuted, we're going to turn it over to you, Ms. McCochran, to call the roll. Okay. Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbsheets? Aye. Nystrom? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Rescate? Aye. Rogers? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much. As RuPaul says, congratulations. All right. So we will take um, a, a five minute break since we've been um, on this item for some time now. And I know that folks might have things to attend to. Um, so we're going to take a five minute, five minute or so break and come back at about four o'clock. Um, Mr. Fu, if I, if I can just very quickly, and I will be very quick, uh, just congratulate the board on um, moving forward with two packages that started before I started before my seven-year anniversary <laughs> with this board. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for the hard work today and for the REGS unit and for Mr. Glassbeagle for working on public comments so that we could get this moving forward and uh, make some progress on these two gigantic issues that the board has been working on for years. So I just want to thank everyone for their hard work. Thank you, Ms. Um, Sork. And, and I appreciate you doing that because um, it's important to acknowledge great achievements and to, and to take a moment to do that. And my apologies for, for rushing through that important acknowledgement moment. So thank you for holding that space. and and doing that. Um, and, and because of that, we will get an extra five minutes more of break time. So we'll come back at 4.05. So double thanks and gratitude to you, Ms. Sorek, for that. So the board will reconvene at 4.05. At All right, the time being 4.05, um, we're going to ask that um, Ms. McCochran, if you can um, call the roll just to make sure that we still have quorum. Whoops, I may have been unmuted when I did that. Um, so, excuse me, the time being 4.05, um, let's call the roll to see if we have, uh, if we've maintained our quorum. I can go through it real quick. Great, thanks, Ms. Mark. Uh, thanks, Mr. Glassfield. No problem. Uh, Kasuga. Here. Cervantes? Here. Fu? Here. Harp Sheets? Here. Nystrom? Here. Phillips? Here. Rescate? Here. Rogers? Here. Tate? Here. Everyone's here. All right. So um, for sequencing purposes, we need to take up item 24, emergency preparedness at hot committee report in consideration of possible action. I'm going to turn this item over to you, Ms. Cervantes. Thank you. Uh, so item number 24 in um, in your board packet, uh, it's in this, it's the last page in the combined packet, um, is a recommendation from the emergency ad hoc uh, committee that I sit on with Dr. Rogers. And this is, um, there's, this is a, a two-parter for your consideration today. Uh, first, it is the statutory language that is um, in the memo for item number 24, and then this, and I'll I'll come back and review that. Let me just tell you what the second part of um, our request for consideration is. 
um, um, a meeting uh, between um, the committee chair and executive officer uh, to uh, contact the business and profession uh, committee staff to discuss um, questions related to COVID in the sunset review and uh, this language if we approve it. So moving over to the language in the in the in the memo in the board packet. Um, in the in the emergency preparedness committee, we have uh, reviewed and considered uh, various aspects of our operations uh, in light of COVID, and one of our goals is to um, build resiliency for our board and operations should there be another emergency in the future. And so, so given that, um, as the, the, the grounding, if you will, for our discussions, um, we've come up with um, this uh, statutory language for your consideration today. Uh, should I go ahead and uh, read it? Sure, um, that'll be great, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you, Jason. So it's a so so this is the proposed language, and if um, we agree to it today, it could be part of our sunset review. So the letter A is uh, during a declared federal, state, or local emergency the board may waive application of any provisions of this chapter or the regulations adopted pursuant to if in the board's opinion, the waiver will aid in the provision of client mental health services. Letter B, notwithstanding any other law, the board may act to continue a waiver of any provision of this chapter or the regulations adopted pursuant to if or up to 60 days following the termination of the declared emergency if, in the board's opinion, the continued waiver will aid in the continuity of client mental health services. So this is um, what is um, for, before you for your consideration today. Uh, we would request your approval. Um, So, um, any uh, discussion? Um, my question, if this, um, it seems like, if I understand this, it's bypassing DCA. Um, so that's one question I'd like clarified. And also, um, if we put this as part of the sunset package, it seems to be asking for a significant um, power would could it potentially jeopardize the approval of our sunset review? Those are my questions. Thank you. I'm going to um, ask Ms. Sorek if she could um, help in answering uh, your questions. And maybe Ms. Marks as well. She helped us uh, create the language. I'm actually going to defer to uh, Ms. Marks on this one because I think when we talked about um, what we could do in our practice act to allow for more flexibility, um, we did have a couple of sections that um, the department uh, deferred to the board uh, to be able to waive certain requirements because we had existing um, authority in our statute uh, to be able to make those uh, waivers, but to be a little more broad, um, you're correct, Dr. Harpsheets, that this would allow more flexibility in uh, granting uh, more than uh, one or two waivers. Um, so I will defer to Ms. Marks for additional uh, clarification. 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Shorrock. Yeah, the idea is that the board would have its own independent authority, uh, independent of DCA, to um, waive certain provisions of its laws where there is a declared uh, federal, state, or local emergency. The board has very limited uh, ability to do so. It's mostly with respect to allowing uh, extra time to uh, either obtain all the requ minimum requirements for licensure. Um, I think those are, and I think some CE extensions or exemptions, but it's fairly limited and this would be independent, there, an independent authority to do so, so that the board would not have to um, experience any delay in having to go through the approval process. With respect to your second question on Sunset, I do think I'm going to have to toss that one back to Ms. Sork to answer the question about whether or not it would be um, uh, something that would would be a, you know, a little bit of a heavier load to get um, to, to carry. Before moving on, um, Ms. Marks, can you tell us a little bit about how some of the other boards uh, have similar language already? I believe this language was uh, roughly based on language uh, that Ms. Marks had um, seen from the Board of Pharmacy. Um, so that is a board that did have uh, this kind of waiver authority. I don't know, Ms. Marks, if there were any other programs that you were aware of, but th that's the only uh, program that I'm aware of. And then if I can, once you're done with uh, this language section, I just wanted to speak to the, uh, the conversation with the Business and Professions Committee when you get to that point, so. Uh, yeah, that's Correct. I was aware of some similar language from the Board of Pharmacy's uh, Practice Act. Uh, I'm, I'm just not aware of uh, other provisions and other practice acts. There may be that some. There may not be. I just don't. I'm just not fully versed in that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And then were we um did we answer um Dr. Arbsheet's um second question? I don't think it's been addressed yet. I'll jump in. Um so um this is Sayron. I would I would say with regard to the sunset review process, usually board a BMP staff will let us know if it does become a heavier lift. And so if it's gonna be an issue where we won't be able to include it in our sunset bill. Um, they would just let us know, and we would then, um, pursuant to the action requested here, um, go ahead then and work to find a bill author um, and have that taken care of through that avenue. So um, I think we get pretty good feedback from our BMP uh, colleagues there. So um, if it does become an issue, that would that's likely what would happen. It's my suspicion. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other comments? I had a quick question. I noticed that you put for mental health services as opposed to psychological services. I'm assuming that was an intentional choice. Am I correct? Um, I believe so, Ms. Marks. Uh, I believe that was uh, an intentional choice in the discussion with the committee in terms of seeing that the emergencies uh, that that might come up would most the, the board would most want to exercise uh, waiver provision you know, the waiver of certain provisions to address continuity of care issues and um, other 
mental health services as opposed to psychological services that may not fall into the mental health realm. It was a way also of just limiting this authority, which would otherwise be seen as very, very broad. And I think most of the waivers that the board sought uh, at the start of the um, at the start of COVID were really to address uh, the continuity of care. I would um, argue, sorry, um, I would like urge um, the use of psychological services because I think that this um, excludes some of the psychological services that need continuation of care during um, emergency situations, particularly for individuals that have developmental disabilities. So a lot of those are not specific to mental health, but they're important psychological services that needs to be to be provided. I'm also thinking of the, the face to face supervision requirement that we currently have. Uh, there's lots of different graduate students in lots of different types of supervision, some industrial organizational or uh, or uh, you know non non mental health related services. Um, where we would effectively be cutting them off from being able to do supervision if we had a situation like we currently do, where people are trying not to meet face to face. So I would agree um, with uh, Dr. Kasuga that that it would, in some ways, it'd be more optimal if we had psychological services. If you think you could only get it for mental health services, that's a whole other issue. I think that's a a political question that I, I can't mm -hmm. answer actually. Yeah. I I don't that's um that's interesting. Um let's um uh, Ms. Sora, can you talk a little bit about the meeting? Uh just to point out um for uh, timing wise, um, mm -hmm. I had prepared, I think, this memo in October. Um, mm -hmm. And after that uh, memo was written, um, we received the supplemental COVID questionnaire from the Business and Professions Committee, um, which actually uh, we had come up with this language, so staff preemptively put that in the draft responses, which you guys will be talking about later in the meeting. Um, but I wanted to make sure um, that if we did include it in the supplemental with the example of, because they asked if uh, the board wanted any additional authority um, to deal with an emergency situation, um, that a meeting may not be necessary if the language is in the supplemental, um, other than just to clarify if they have any questions about the supplemental, which we can certainly um, have the chair uh, be in touch with the BMP uh, committee staff um, to answer questions about what the board answered in the supplemental. I just wanted to point that out for clarification. Yeah. So if we were to change the language here to psychological services and then um, uh, move forward with that language because we really don't have control over what language the legislature ultimately uses. Um, is that um, is that a, a better path for us? Ms. Sorek? Um, if you wanted to uh, change this, uh, we could make the same change to the supplemental uh, questionnaire. And and the, we can always ask, as Ms. Cervantes uh, mentioned, mm -hmm. the committee to consider it, and it's always up to their discretion, um, you know, what kind of language uh, they feel comfortable with. So I guess the question right now is then, 
what do we feel most comfortable with? I feel most comfortable with psychological services if we can get it through. If we can't get it through in that form, mental health services is fine. I mean, I understand the focus is on mental health services, mm -hmm. but it does limit our ability to use our new waiver power. I agree with Dr. Phillips. I would love it to say psychological services because it's more more broad for our purposes. Um, mental health services is much more narrow, but, but um, I understand if it doesn't go through. Okay. So um, may I make a suggestion? And I'm happy to also be the it's rare these days I get to make a motion. So <laughs> but, Do it. <laughs> well, I would ask that um, Mr. Glassbeagle, if you could on the screen just substitute client mental health services to just put the client psychological services so that folks are able to follow on here um, and to do so in the second paragraph B. Um, and then I'm happy to move um, that um, the board approve the attached language as amended and seek legislation to make said additions to the Board's Practice Act and to delegate the oh, <laughs> Preparedness Committee Chair and the Executive Officer to contact BMP Committee staff to include for consideration as part of Sunset Review. Second. Thank you. So we have a motion uh, to approve this uh, statutory language before you. Uh, it's it's different from what you were emailed. We just changed uh, mental health services to psychological services, um, and um, also uh, enable the board chair, the the committee chair, sorry, uh, and executive officer to meet with the BMP uh, committee. And it was seconded by the motion uh, was by Mr. Fu, and it was seconded by uh, Dr. Phillips. Um, did I get that right? Amen. Call for public comment, Mr. Vontes. <laughs> yes, let's open for public comment. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of like um, make one comment that I appreciate that the consideration of psychological services. I just think that this is not a political issue. The individuals with with developmental disabilities that ha that require psychological services is a big proportion of our consumers. And, you know, like, um, I don't think that they should be discarded just because of um, the intent to, to pass along, um, to pass this along. So, that's something that um, I wanted to highlight. Another thing too is we may not get a lot of of um, comments from that particular um, group, but it doesn't mean that they are not requiring services. So um, I think that um, we should always put that in mind when we're thinking about consumers of psychological services that it's not all just mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, any other board comments? And then I'll open the public comment. I'm sorry, I, I'm out of, I did those things out of order. Thank you, Dr. Kazuga. Oh, yeah. Hi, this is Julie. Just wanted to make um, a comment. Um, I am an employee of the uh, California State Legislature, and so I will be abstaining on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, moderator, could we open the public comment? Is there uh, any member of the public who would like to comment? I believe, Dr. I believe Dr. Joe and Crow would like to make a comment. Oh, I don't see. 
Hi. Oh, okay. So, sorry about oh, that. That's okay. Uh, please. Um, yes, Joe Lindercro with uh, CPA. I want to uh, support the notion of, of using the term psychological services, and I'm wondering, because Dr. Phillips was saying, and, and as um, Dr. Kusuga is saying, um, not only are those issues important, um, but you have licensees who do work other than provide mental health services, for example, IO psychologists. So I'm wondering, isn't there language that you might be able to use either psychological services or just to say the provision of services as allowed under the under the under the license or something like that? Because um, it is broader than mental health services, and we don't want to kind of go backwards. I mean, we spend a lot of time like talking to IO psychologists and so forth about the the value of having a license. So I I want to support the notion of being inclusive of all of your licensees and not just those who provide mental health services. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? I don't see any other comments in here, so I think you may be good. Okay, thank you. So, um, before um, we close the discussion and um, and call for a vote, um, is is the language inclusive enough of our licensees, um, Ms. Marks, with this change? I think it is because 2903, and I can certainly appreciate what um, what Dr. Pesuga and Dr. Linda Crow are raising, and as well mm -hmm. as, uh, anyone else who raised it. But I do think it's okay because it says the practice of psychology. This is 2903. The practice of psychology is defined as rendering or offering to render to individuals, groups, organizations, or the public any psychological service, including. And mental health is included in that, but the, the overall scope is the provision of psychological service. So I, I, I think using that phrase instead of mental health would include any psychological service that is um, provided under the license. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any other board comment? Are we ready to call this for a vote? Uh, just a, there is, a uh, question. Oh, go I'm ahead. sorry, uh, Ms. Fontes. There's one other issue that, um, or one question I have about that. Can make sure I have this right. Maybe Dr. Linda Crow can address it. Whether or not there are psychological IO psychological services that are provided where there is no client. That oh. uh, that I. I don't know because it does say you're, it's pre it's being rendered uh -huh. services are rendered to individuals, groups, organizations. So it seems to me like there always is a client. It just may not be an individual, but I just want to make sure from Dr. Linda Crow about that. Uh, and my other question before the board votes is that I would just like some clarity from Ms. Nystrom as to whether or not she's just not comfortable. Um, voting and abstaining or whether she feels she has a conflict and needs to put a recusal on the record. That's all. Um, uh, let's, um, um, do you want me to go first? Yes. Okay. Um, this is Dr. Linda Crow. You know, I think, um, Ms. Marks, you've made an excellent observation. And while there is sometimes uh, some discussion about whether an organization is a client. Um, I think um, maybe it's better just to delete the word client. Uh, I'm not sure it's necessary. You could just say the waiver will aid in the provision of psychological services. Would that be acceptable? Uh, or from a legal standpoint, is that your question? or? Well, I'm just asking, would that work? Would that work? Just to take that word out. I don't, it doesn't seem to be really necessary, given the conversation about psychological services. That is what people are delivering. 
Correct. <laughs> and, and if there is ever a question, 2903 says they're delivering psychological services to right. individuals. It doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't client. use the word that client, kind of, right? It does not. It uses yeah. individual group I think that would be a. I think that would be a nice, um, a nice change. I, I just. Dr. I'm thinking, Phillips. Yeah, I was thinking that the purpose of this is, <coughs> uh, so that we're in a better position to provide services to consumers of one sort or another. Um, so I wonder if, in taking the word client, uh, it just sounds like we're giving ourselves free reign without consideration. Consumer, I mean, this may be getting so granular it doesn't matter. Yeah, I think it is getting a little bit granular because you just you just don't know. You know, your licensees do a lot of things, and um, and the and the pandemic has disrupted all those things. So it's not just. Um, you know, providing telehealth or or something like that. It just, it just has disrupted everything. So when there is an emergency, the board may need to do a number of things that no one has any way of predicting at this very moment. And I can imagine a psychologist, for instance, creating a program to serve community needs without right. having a particular client. So maybe I think you're right. I think mm -hmm. client. Okay. Um, so, um, what what do we do? Uh, we have a motion on the table. So, what do we do procedurally? Can someone help me? So, um, this is Sarah. Um So, I think um, Ms. March has a question to Ms. Nystrom about her um, her declaration of intention to abstain. So, we should go to Ms. Nystrom first, and then after Thank that, you. pending yes. no Thank further board comments, well, you can just call the roll of Ms. McCochran. Uh, Ms. Nystrom. I'm sorry, can you read that? No worries. Um, so, um, Mark asked if um, if your if your abstention was because you sensed there was going to be a conflict of interest and you were seeking recusal, or if um, I think you just sent for further explanation of that. And and oh, um, yeah. yes, I'm I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, I was um, well. I'm, Perceived or actual conflict of interest was my concern, um, and so I was going to abstain. Um, but if you have additional guidance, um, that would be well received. Okay. Um, Ms. Nystrom, you I don't have enough information to provide guidance as to whether or not you have a conflict and should abstain, and we can look at that. Uh, later, and it's often on a case by case basis. I was just curious now if it was more of a cautionary um, measure on your part and you felt like you did not want to participate um, or vote, or whether you knew of a particular conflict in this area and needed to recuse yourself. So, um, for, for these purposes, if you're not aware of any particular conflict, you can uh, abstain from voting, and we can talk in the future about what you think may be an actual conflict that would um, be better served by recusing yourself from any participation or vote. Okay, let's go ahead um, and, and we can talk further in the future, but for um, for this purpose, I think that um, I think that recusing myself um, from voting is I'm sorry, um, did you say it was appropriate? I didn't hear that. Uh, oh, yeah, it's appropriate for me to, to not vote on this issue. Better safe than sorry. Thank you, I agree. Um, okay, thank you so much uh, for all your comments. So now we have a, a I have a procedural uh, question about uh, the motion and removing this word client in the language. Uh, could we just do that? And just ask if that's um, okay with the person who made the motion and the second? That's fine with me. But I, I thought we're keeping it and leaving it alone. But I'm fine regardless. Dr. Phillips, you are the second on that. I am perfectly okay with that. With wait, with taking out client or keeping
keeping quiet. Taking it out. Okay. That's it. Okay. All right. So our mo so our motion is uh, to uh, to adopt the la the language that's before you here in um, here on the screen. That um, should I read it out out, Noreen? Is that easier? So, I'm happy to restate the motion if that helps, Ms. Cervantes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, the motion before us here is to um, to move to approve the attached language presented here as amended and seek legislation to make uh, said additions to the board's practice act, as well as delegate to the emergency preparedness committee chair and the executive officer to contact the BMP committee staff to include for consideration as part of sunset. And so that's our motion and can we and it was already second by Dr. Phillips. Can we call for a vote? Yes. Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Herb Sheets? Aye. Nystrom? Abstain. Phillips? Aye. Rescate? Aye. Rogers? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. Yay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and um, Mr. Fu, you'll, you'll go through the next item, which is our um, sunset. That, that's correct. Thanks so much, Mr. Vantes, and thanks to you and Dr. Rogers for um, serving on this committee and taking us um, to new fronts. I, I want to say that I was um, at the ASPBB meeting um, and had the opportunity to attend virtually. And um, when I mentioned this work, a lot of folks were really interested in, in what this looked like um, because folks were saw this as very forward thinking and reflective of um, the the current moment. So hats off to both you both of you, and thank you for that. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, Ms. Marks, and Ms. Sorek. All right, so we're going to pick up item uh, 22, which is our sunset report. Um, folks will recall that the board previously adopted the sunset report, and you may wonder why we're seeing this again. As Ms. Sorg alluded to in her response um, on the previous item, the Business and Professions Committee has, has provided us an additional supplemental um, as it relates to the current pandemic. Um, I should also mention that the board was granted a one-year extension um, last year because of our inability, because of the legislator, legislature's compressed timeline and priority of bills that um, immediately address the pandemic situation. Um, and so this sunset report you see before you um, is reflective of the, um, the comments for um, the COVID um, committee and inserts what we um, just adopted um, as well. Um, into the language um, for the sunset report. Um, so the you can see the board actions and responses to COVID-19 on page uh, 72 um, of the of this item or PDF 73 of 75 if you're looking at this separately. Um, and the new language is in red. Um, Ms. Sorek, any additional items on this that I may have missed? Uh, no additional items. Um, I just, uh, in uh, speaking with Dr. Harbsheets uh, the other day, there was um, an amendment that was missed. Um, and uh, I'm just scrolling down to identify what that was. Apologies. Um, sorry, the document. This, was this in reference to changing the um, board committee member roster to? to uh, no, actually, it was just um, our ASPBB meeting attendance. Um, there were um, other meetings uh, that we did not include um, that uh, she mentioned to add in um, the February 2020 mid year meeting and the October. 
2020, not November uh, meeting. Um, also, the board attended the chair's virtual meeting in October 2020 and the chair's meeting in June of 2020. So um, I appreciate Dr. Harpsheet seeing that and we want to show uh, when we do have the ability to attend outreach, uh, things that we include all the meetings that we're attending. So I appreciate her attention to detail. Thank you, Dr. Harpsheet. Um, Dr. Harpsheet, did you have comments? No, sorry, I just accidentally clicked, sorry. No, it's all good, it's all good. We're all, um, it's late and I understand. It. Um, just want to add then, um, Ms. Oric, do we, should we then update the Table 1B then? Since we're adding, since we're, this report was written obviously and approved last November or early February, I can't remember at this point. But so since then we have uh, um, Ms. Roscate joining us and Ms. Nystrom jo joining us. So, um, and Dr. Rogers also joining us too. So do we need to update Table 1B, the Blink Committee member roster as a part of this or? Or, or not? It's it's a policy call of the board, but um, essentially, I think what the BNP committee would like to see are things that we need to highlight as changes. So I just focused on anything connected mostly to policy, um, and um, and so those were the changes uh, that I with the management team um, went through and made. Uh, those were our focuses. Otherwise, there's lots of data points um, that would need to be updated and given the short turnaround because this is due December 1, um, we just kind of went to the need to update um, information. So once we get to the hearing phase, um, there may be an opportunity for additional back and forth from the committee, which typically happens before the hearing phase, um, we would be able to update on uh, new board members, et cetera. Okay, understood, that's really helpful. So um, with the addition of Dr. Harpsheet's amendment, um, may I have a motion to approve the updated sensor report as amended with the insertion of those meeting dates? Um, and uh, I so move. I'll second. I'll second. Moved by harp sheet, seconded by Tate, I believe is when I saw the the mic in order. Um, is there additional board comment? All right, not seeing additional board comment. Um, Madam moderator, could you please open public comment section for this item? Um, we have, so the public comment section has been opened. Um, folks, go ahead and type in if you want, like to make a comment. Seeing and hearing none, we're going to close the comment section on um, item 22 with regard to the uh, review and possible approval of sunset report. Um, and we are going to bring it back to the board. I don't see additional board hands or mute, or excuse me, unmute my unmuted mics. Wow. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Ms. McCochran to call the roll, please. Okay. Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harpsheet? Aye. Aye. Nice. Okay. Oh, sorry. Nystrom? Okay. Abstain. Abstain. Phillips? Aye. Riscate? Aye. Rogers? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much, Ms. McCochran. All right. So, we're just laying out some guidance for everyone here. What we're going to do is, we, just as a reminder, the board still has um, closed session cases to meet on with regard to um, petition hearings um, that we will need to convene for. Um, and there are a couple outstanding items on the agenda here as well that need to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up on item 25 first on the election of officers. 
Um, and I'm going to turn that over to our council uh, on that front. So um, I'm going to turn this over to one of our three fabulous councils. I think I drew the, the uh, I'm not going to say short straw, but I think I, I drew this assignment. Um, <laughs> we have the uh, election of officers. The board has two officers, the president and vice president, the um, duties of which are spelled out in the board's administrative manual. In the past, what we have done is taken this uh, office by office. So what we've done is said um, we open it up for nominations on the first office and, and take any nominations, and then we go through and we um, have each individual board member vote if there's more than one nomination that board member indicates uh, for whom they are voting, and then we'll take the second office. And I don't know if the board has a um, preference on which office you want to start with. I believe in the past we've started with the president, and I will do that unless anybody has a, an idea that we should start with vice president. Okay. So I think uh, what we've done before is open up the floor for the nomination for the office of president. I would like to nominate uh, Mr. Seiron Fu, our ABLE president. And oh, I will take this opportunity to also note that nominations do not require a second. We've had, we've had seconds before, but it's not required. So we have one nomination for Mr. Fu as president. Are there any other nominations? I am not hearing any, so um, if, there, if you want to uh, open the floor up to the public for public comment before the board, board votes. Uh, Dr. Phillips, I saw your mic go on briefly. I didn't know if you thought that the, we should have board uh, discussion on that. I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, it, doesn't, it does not appear necessary. I'm sorry, I left my uh, mic unmuted. Okay, so then I will ask uh, if we can open up the process for any public comments. On my end, I'm not seeing any requests for public comment. I also do not see any. Okay, thank you, um, moderator. Uh, so then I, what I would ask the board to do is, as your name is called, indicate uh, whether you're voting yay or nay to elect Mr. Seiron Fu as president. The board has in the past um, had the term of office starting from January 1 of the next calendar year, so this would be for January 1 starting January 1 of 2021 through the uh, remainder of the calendar year. So, um, Ms. Uh, who's, who, oh, Ms. Yeah, Ms. McCoughlin, are you calling the roll, please? Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if it was me or you. I'll go ahead and call roll, um, or not roll, but the vote. Kasuga? Yay. Cervantes? Yay. Boo. Aye. Heartsheets? Aye. Nystrom? Aye. Philip? Aye. Rescate? Aye. Rogers? Aye. Tate? Aye. Okay. Okay. I think you have your present for 2021. <laughs> It's better in person. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.
you for being willing to do that again, Sayron. Thank you. I really appreciate the, the trust that the board has put in me. I really appreciate it. Mr. Fu, do you have any other comments before we go on? Just my gratitude to the board and, and to the collective service that we all are engaging in on behalf of, of this work. And thank you, Ms. Hart. Okay, thank you. So then the next uh, office is Vice President, and we would open up the floor to nominations for Vice President, and this again would be for the calendar year of 2021, beginning January 1, 2021. So again, nominations do not require a second, and we can open up the floor for nominations. I nominate Dr. Mary Harpsey. I nominate Dr. Leah Tate. Okay, is there any other board discussion on this matter? We ask them if they are willing to um, serve the role. I'm sorry, Dr. Kasuga, I didn't understand that. Other people may have understood that. Um, I would just want to know if um, the, the two people that were nominated um, are interested in assuming the role. Uh oh, <clears throat> okay. I would ask Dr. Harpsheets, would you accept this nomination? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. And Dr. Tate, do you accept this nomination? Absolutely. Okay, great. So we have nominations for Dr. Harpsheets and Dr. Tate for Vice President. I would ask uh, to open up for public comment. Um, Ms. Mark, I have a question. Is it appropriate to ask um, each person to, to state why they're interested or, um, or make comments? I mean, if they, if they feel comfortable making those comments, um, is that appropriate to ask them to do that? I, if they would wish to make comments, you can ask them to make comments. They both have ex expressed um, a willingness to accept the nominations. I don't know if they want to indicate what their uh, interest is or that would be up to them. Understood, thank you. I'm not sure how to respond. I'm happy to make comments. Um, Leah, are you, were you interested in making comments? Um, I like you. I didn't know how to respond. I can make some comments, but go ahead, go first. Uh, I, I'm interested. As I was vice president this year, I I felt like I'd like to do it again to continue the continuity of my involvement in, especially the sunset review. And um, I, I guess I felt like this year we didn't get to do a whole lot. And so I wanted to have continue to have the experience of being vice president. It's, it's been fascinating to learn more and I've appreciated the opportunity this year and would hope to have it again for next year. Thank you. Um, this is Leah Tate. Um, I, I'm interested, you know, here <laughs> had a lot of ups and downs. Um, it's highlighted diversity, racial inequality, a pandemic going on. And I think for me, during this current crisis, I have some assets that I can bring to the board that would support the board and also support our newly elected president. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go back to asking if there were any public comments on the nominations. I am not seeing any on my end. I am not either, and I'll go ahead and close it for you. Thank you. So when um, uh, the role is called if each board member would indicate for whom they are casting their vote. Again, this is for Vice President for the calendar year 2021. We have Dr. Harpsheets and Dr. Tate. Okay. 
Katsuga. Lisa, can you call me? Katsuga. Hard choice, but I'm sticking with uh, Dr. Harpsheet. Okay, Cervantes. Tate. Who? Tate. Harpsheet. Harpsheet. Nystrom. Harpsheet. Philip. Tate. Rescate. Uh, I don't think I know them enough to vote. Um, Ms. Smart, I'm going to defer to you, Ms. Marks. Do, I, do we have to add that, or is there a vote that needs to be made? No. A board member can abstain. Okay. Rogers? Tate. And Tate? Tate. You guys hear me? Yes. It looks like from my, uh, from what I see, there are five votes for Dr. Tate and three votes for Dr. Harpsheet. Lizelle, is that what you have? Yes, I have five for Tate, three for Harpsheet. So the vote is to um, approve Dr. Tate or elect Dr. Tate as vice president for calendar year 2021. Congratulations. Thank you. I believe that's the end of the election of officers, unless uh, Mr. Fu, you would like to say anything um, about uh, the tasks going forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Marks. Um, so, um, first of all, I really want to um, acknowledge the incredible um, work that this board has done all day today and to acknowledge each and every one of you and the leadership roles that everyone has, what everyone has done um, and with with gratitude to that. Um, I also want to to note that we have we have our closed session item and we have a couple more items to go. So just to be clear, um, we're, we're going to take up item, um, excuse me, uh, item 23, but we're only going to take up item 23A for discussion to take public comment, and then we're going to hold the rest of this item to our next meeting, and then we will, um, of course, take on item 26, um, and then go into closed session for the remainder of the day for for the remainder of the day with regard to um, um, the the closed session um, disciplinary matters that we would like to discuss. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask that. Dr. Phillips, um, you provide the enforcement committee report, um, and then we open up public comment for it, and then we hold the remaining any action items until February. Uh, that was the intention in any event. The remainder of the action items uh, relate to uh, a general overhaul of, of legislation and or laws and regulations, and we've not completed that process yet in any event. Um, yeah, this is... a. Uh, Item number 23A concerns the proposed legislation uh, that we were able to um, model after uh, some legislation that the medical board had. The, the, the primary reason that we wanted to move ahead with this legislation related to subpoena power for client records was because we have um, we have a situation uh, which comes up with some regularity both in the context of child custody proceedings and in the context of um, in the context of other cases that we get involved in, where we're stymied in our ability to fulfill the enforcement function uh, because of our inability to obtain patient records. So the stat proposed uh, legislation was based on um, consideration of. Uh, of the privacy of the consumer, but also the need of the board to move forward with its enforcement function and not to be stymied in a way that frustrates uh, the purpose of being able to examine situations more thoroughly. Um, and I'm going to defer to Ms. Monterubio to describe a little bit about the stakeholder process that led to um, the eventual decision to draft this legislation. 
Ms. Monterubio? Yes, thank you. So um, following the child custody stakeholder meeting uh, that was held in September of 2018, uh, the Enforcement Committee reviewed and made changes to Section 2918 of the Business and Professions Code in an effort to ensure the board had authority to collect all necessary documents to complete investigations. Um, as you can see that um, in the memo of my report, um, there is the child custody implementation plan and there are five action items. And this is the last action item for the board. Um, we have completed um, the other four items and now we are looking just to um, add language to uh, 2918. Um, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, uh, Medical Board did this in 1980, I believe. Um, so we looked at their language. Uh, we had our enforcement uh, committee meeting um, just a few months ago and uh, kind of made some final changes to this proposed language and would like for the full board again to review and, and discuss maybe at our, our next meeting. Was it your intention for us to to go through the discussion as the legislation uh, beyond any public comment and come to uh, and uh, take, make a motion on the board's re on the recommendation, or uh, Mr. Fu, or would you prefer for us to just outline it and to take any public comment? I know we've had members of the public patiently waiting for us to to reach this item, and uh, unfortunately the. The agenda today was chock full of lots of stuff, but we did want to give an opportunity for that public comment. But are you looking to to us to, to, to do the motion today, or would you prefer to hold that till uh, the next time, Mr. Fu? I think it would be to hold it for until next time, but I wanted to make sure that we did get public comment in because I know we, we had stakeholders who were here in attendance. So if you could outline the discussion and then open up for public comment with relation to that discussion, but we'll hold the remaining action items until February because we do have those closed session items. Okay. I think that, uh, Ms. Madarubio, I think that that covers the basics. We have given a lot more detailed information in the Enforcement Committee report as it relates to uh, the process and how we came up with what we came up with and, and which considerations we took into account. So uh, my primary interest, unless you disagree, Ms. Monterubio, is to take the public comment at this time. I agree with you, Dr. Phillips. And gosh, I hope I can read when people, so could we open the Q&A for people that would like to make comments? Just put in, I would like to make a comment and then we'll, we will call on you as best we can. Uh, I noticed that Ms. Russell has said that she would like to make a comment. Uh, Ms. Russell, uh, Cognizant of the fact that we do have some time limitations, if you could keep your comments to five minutes, that would be great. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, I do have some prepared comments. I'll try to get through them quickly. I appreciate the board staying late to deal with this um, very important issue. Um, the Center for Judicial Excellence truly appreciates the board's work on the stakeholder meeting follow-up related to the child custody evaluator complaints that are received by the board. As this board knows, although I knew, know you have a few new board members, California children are being killed and court ordered into childhoods that are rife with physical and sexual abuse, often based on reports by this board's licensees who serve as custody evaluators. Um, just as background for the new board members, the Center for Judicial Excellence is on the front lines of a custody crisis involving more than 58,000 American children annually who are court ordered into violent and abusive homes by family law judges in cases where there is a protective, safe parent being denied access to those kids. These children are often put in danger by the judge's reliance on court-ordered psychologist reports called custody evaluations. Many custody evaluations are infected by a specious theory called parental alienation that is not included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as an official diagnosis 
because it is not backed by peer-reviewed research and does not meet the standards required of an official diagnosis per the DSM. At its core, parental alienation suggests that a child's resistance or refusal to visit or live with one of their parents is solely the result of a parent brainwashing or coaching a child to fear or hate the other parent. Instead of focusing on exploring the child's reasons often legitimate for fearing a parent, including sexual and physical abuse, the focus shifts to pathologizing the parent trying to protect their child from sexual or physical abuse by the other parent. Most harmfully, parental alienation suggests a child's protective parent has somehow influenced a child to fabricate child sexual or physical abuse allegations. This Parental alienation movement has resulted in a culture of abuse denial that is putting countless American and California children at risk. And psychologists are playing an outsized role in this epidemic. I wanted the board to know this Tuesday, a 6,500 word article about one of the psychologists involved programs that emotionally torture these minor children whose psychologists have been the subject of numerous complaints submitted to this board in recent years, which were also dismissed with no action, will appear in a respected and influential national news magazine. I will share a copy with the board staff once the article appears. I want to reiterate my concern about the secrecy and lack of public access to the Enforcement Committee because it's an ad hoc committee with no notice requirements and no public access. Had we been afforded the opportunity to discuss this item directly with the Enforcement Committee before this approach was decided upon and the memo written, we would not need to eat up valuable board meeting time today. As for the statutory change being proposed, we appreciate any effort by the board to fix state law to ensure the completion of investigations. As I've told this board in the past, your complaint process is the only resort for parents whose children have been placed with an abusive parent. Immunity laws protect your psychologist from any litigation avenue to address harmful reports about impacting a child. So your board is the only uh, avenue for redress for these cases. We are deeply concerned about comments in your memo on this agenda item that state under current law, the board regularly finds itself unable to complete investigations. If you go on to say further under current law, the board is likely to continue finding itself fighting an uphill battle in subpoena enforcement proceedings, which are costly and time consuming. The psychotherapy patient privilege does not apply to child custody cases. Custody evaluators are forensic psychologists, not treating psychotherapists, and they do not enter into a psychotherapy relationship with their parent patients. So this privilege is not at all relevant to the issues that were brought out in the stakeholder meeting. In fact, signed agreements between forensic psychologists and their divorcing parent clients explicitly spell out this distinction and notify the clients that all confidentiality is waived when the custody evaluation information is submitted to the court. I want this board and committee to know that there's an important bill that your peers at the Board of Behavioral Sciences spent two years working closely on with the Assembly Judiciary Committee and then Assemblyman Dave Jones to close the licensing loophole dealing with confidentiality Confidential Custody Reports, AB 1843, was signed into law in 2014. It amended BMP Code Section 129, Family Code Section 3025.5, and 3111, relating to child custody. As a matter of background, Ms. Monterubio told me back in the summer of 2016 that BOP staff had consulted with attorneys and gotten permission to make an administrative change to issue administrative subpoenas in child custody complaint investigations 
to get around the issue of a parent refusing. Ms. Russell? Yes. Uh, we've gone past the five minutes at this point, so if you could conclude your comments. Sure. Um, as background, we were told that this administrative subpoena issue was going to get around the issue of a parent denying um, access to their reports. So um, we have real problems with this as your actionable statutory change because it is not relevant to the issues that were brought to the stakeholder meeting. And we would be happy to work with your staff between now and February to find a statutory resolution if one is needed that is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you for that valuable feedback. Uh, I think next in line is Catherine Campbell. Ms. Campbell? And if the moderator could please uh, time and give a half minute warning. I will do that. Thank you. Uh, hi, yes, um, thank you so much. Catherine Campbell from the California Protective Parents Association. Um, I'm going to echo um, Ms. Russell and her comments that these children are being severely harmed and what we need to realize is that when you go to see a custody evaluator, that's not your psychologist. These, these children who are being abused are actually seeing someone as a psychologist. This person is hired, your licensees are hired to come in and evaluate what is happening. They're not the psychologist for these children. They're the evaluators. And these are court documents and and it is so important that it is understood um the false the false information and the straight out lies that are being put in these documents to allow these children to stay in abuse is uh it's outrageous and it's um it's disturbing and and these need to be looked at and and there is law, as, as Ms. Russell said, there is law that says these are, uh, in family code, these are allowed to be seen by the investigator. Um, so I'm not sure of all of this information in um, the report that was put out on November 16th. The report on November 16th um, from Ms. Monterubio also talks about this um, parental alienation and they're going to ask people and it seems as if almost that it's become that you've added it as a buzzword instead of really looking what you're going to do because depending on the answer given further review will be undertaken on a case-by-case -case basis um, that is so um, unclear um, of what you're going to do with that it seems almost as if it was just put in there um, to say we put it in there uh, and but it doesn't say what you're doing with it um, parental alienation is used it was created by a man who wanted an excuse for sexually abusing children and and it has been received more attention than it ever deserves i don't know why we've allowed people to go on with this um, it's it's disturbing um, that we would rather blame a protective parent than look at a child being abused. And I think maybe it's easier. Uh, most of these protective parents are women, over 95%. And um, people have been blaming women for a long time. And to say, oh, she's crazy is easy to say, it seems. Um, there is a culture to dismiss abuse, as I mentioned yesterday. And I I'm not sure any of this actually addresses you know, saying that there's going to be six hours of domestic violence every three years, um, six hours of continued education and child abuse. Um, I'm just, I'm just not sure what, what, how is that? I mean, education definitely needs to happen and I appreciate that and that's powerful, but I'm not sure it doesn't, how it's going to ch change the culture. We only have 10%. Ms. Campbell, you have one minute. Oh, thank you. We only have 10% of abuse substantiated. And with only four to six falls, that means 86% of our kids are being dismissed and forced to live in abuse. And we know from the, we know from the numbers, billions of dollars to California 
for these children um, that we we are having these children live in abuse and we know that is so wrong i think as adults we need to step forward and say enough and this board is is so responsible for these people and of all your board members it's not a, a lot of board members compared to all the people who do your work for your life so we're talking about like you said 18 people right um and how many of complaints for those 18 people from separate families I, I just don't know. And I appreciate this board wanting to do better. And I really appreciate Thank you, Ms. Campbell. I have muted you now. Uh, next, I have Connie Valentine. Hello? Hello, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am the past president of California Protective Parents Association, and I reiterate what both Ms. Russell and, and um, Catherine Campbell both said. The part I would like to highlight is that, yes, legislation was put into place in order to have access to the evaluators' reports so that the board can do its job. And it, these are not Business and Profession 2918 issues. These are not confidential client, client psychologist communications. These are reports made for the court. So you already have access to them. One of the things that happens is that the report goes to the court before it's been corrected by the litigants. And it's read by the court before witnesses are heard, which is, would never happen in a regular trial, but it does happen in family court. So therefore, getting it right is extremely important, and there are often many, many errors. So that's how important this issue is, that it needs to be correct, that the people need to be on top of their game, they're doing it, and they need to be very much trauma-informed. That we don't see covered in what what you're suggesting. The other issue is that a custody evaluation, the evaluator can charge whatever the market will bear. And I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear that some of them in wealthier counties charge $60,000 for an evaluation. That's more than most people make in a, in a year. And they, they do that routinely in wealthy counties. Often these are paid by the accused and often the accused gets exactly the outcome that they wish on the recommendation. And that's what the judge follows. So you can see how important what the work that you're doing, and we totally applaud you for doing it, but we believe that it should go a little farther um, in various directions than, <clears throat> than what you proposed. So please call upon us. We are um, anxious to help. We would love to see this stop uh, this, this fleecing of, of litigants, for one thing, this uh, process problem that's totally not not fair, and the uh, the entire system needs to be overhauled with custody evaluators. So please call upon us. We're happy to help. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all of the uh, public commenters. It was valuable information. And we appreciate you taking the time to stick out the day with us. Um, I did want to, for for the benefit of new board members, uh, the committee that is the enforcement committee is composed of two individuals, one a licensed member and one a public member, as a point of information. The reason it is kept at that size is so that we can have meetings that do not need to be publicly noticed. That sounds bad. However, what happens at an enforcement committee meeting is um, unique to the enforcement function in the sense that enforcement committee meetings are attended by all of our enforcement analysts who help us to understand what issues they're facing. Uh, at times, there's indirect or direct discussion of uh, particulars as it relates to a particular licensee. It would be impossible for us to have that kind of level of discourse 
and it would be impossible for us to have our enforcement analysts whose identities are um, kept confidential because of threats against them um, and for their safety. Uh, so it is different, but however, whatever recommendations or action is taken by the enforcement committee, as we've explained to the public commenters on occasions before, um, are all brought to the board for public discussion. And it's at this time that we receive the public comment. We very much appreciate the public comments that we received today. And um, that concludes the report of the Enforcement Committee. Dr. Thank Phillips, you. we do have one last uh, request for comment by Dr. Linda Crow. Or Crow, sure. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Certainly, Dr. Linda Crow, and then we'll conclude. And if you could time Dr. Linda Crow also. Hi, yes, I have my timer on. Um, I want to uh, just focus on uh, on one main um, area here, and that is that this proposal uh, very definitely does seem to suggest an erosion of the psychotherapist patient privilege. Uh, certainly, um, it will come as no surprise uh, to to hear me say that that is a cornerstone of psychotherapy. Um, that patient confidentiality, and that I hope the board views your role in consumer protection not only to protect from harm, but also to protect um, consumers' rights to confidential mental health um, services. Um, as uh, a couple of people have already stated, the fact uh, is that this proposal came out of the stakeholder meeting uh, focused on custody evaluation. Um, we were not at that meeting, and, and uh, if there is another stakeholder meeting, we would certainly want to be included in that meeting. But um, the the truth is, and, and this has been stated, that in Family Code 3025.5, you already have access to custody uh, reports. And the second point that has already been mentioned is that there is no therapy privilege in custody reports. These are reports that belong to the court, and there is no psychotherapy, no therapeutic relationship between a custody evaluator and um, the parents, the child uh, in, this, in these cases. So we are concerned um, in general that your proposal seems to address an exception to the, the privilege where there is none. And that uh, finally, you also mentioned in your proposal the exception to extend more broadly. And certainly, given that this is, um, the, as I said, the cornerstone of psychotherapy, we would certainly have to object to any erosion, as is suggested here, in the patient um, psychotherapist patient privilege. We're not sure what problem you're trying to solve. We have consulted with some of our colleagues who are both expert reviewers for the board and who also um, are child custody evaluators. Um, and from what we have heard in talking with them, um, the people who are expert reviewers have not indicated that they have had uh, a problem in making these kinds of decisions and um, so we just want to, we want to lay all that out. We just could never support this kind of erosion, uh, and frankly, um, have concern about um, how that would really assist in your investigations of complaints, particularly about child custody evaluations. And then, of course, the fact that it is that it's broadened out even beyond child custody evaluations does cause us a lot of concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lots of uh, wonderful points brought up today that will be discussed again uh, when we bring this, uh, bring this proposed legislation or some form thereof back to the board. Uh, we'll certainly take some of these things into consideration when, when there's further discussion in the enforced committee, and we very much appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fu, unless you have any specific questions or Want to have board discussion? I think we can call it a day. Uh, call it a day there. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. And seeing and hearing no further board discussion, just want to take up item 26: recommendations for agenda items for future board meetings. 
Please note that the board may not discuss or take any action on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda for a future meeting. Um, Madam moderator, could you please open the um, comment public comment section for folks? All right, please indicate if you would like to make a public comment on item 26. Seeing and hearing none, Madam Moderator, you can go ahead and close this, the public comment section with much appreciation to our stakeholders who stuck it out with us. Our board members, do you have any items that you would like to add? All right, so board members don't have any items and we'll close out item 26. So um, with that being said, um, this concludes the open session um, items for today. And before we go into closed session, um, you know, while one should always express their gratitude, um, it is the season of thanks. And I would like to appreciate to share just how grateful I am of our board members, of our board staff and DCA staff at Council and Solid for their service to the state of California. Um, I also want to take the time in particular to express my thanks to Dr. Harpsheets, who has served as vice president of the board and will continue to serve as chair of the licensure committee um, next year. And I know I have benefited from her wisdom and thoughtful approach and offer my sincere gratitude to her and her service. Um, the other thing I just want to say as well um, is that living here in the Los Angeles metro area, I do want to acknowledge that I reside on historical and present lands of the Tonga people. And I urge you all who are listening to learn about the indig indigenous people that have and continue to live in your regions. Um, with that, um, the board will go into closed session to meet uh, in pursuant to Government Code Section 11126C3 to discuss disciplinary matters, includes proposed decisions, stipulations, petitions for reinstatement and modification for commit penalty, petitions for reconsideration and remand. Um, the board will adjourn upon the end of closed session and will not take up additional open session items. Oh, and I should mention board members, please stay on WebEx um, and solid, please secure the virtual room. Thank you and happy holidays.